Okay, then I'm going to do a quick five minutes, like, wham through all of the material we covered yesterday. Then we're going to do rounds one through five uh, as the competition. You can ask me questions during it. It's fine. And, uh, and yeah, that'll be sort of our review and making sure that we're still remembering the stuff from yesterday. Actually, what I forgot to do is I wanted to go find a clip from, like, UHF, that Weird Al movie, where there was uh, Michael Douglas, or not Michael Douglas, whatever the guy who's played Kramer in, uh, in Seinfeld. There's a great little clip in there where they flip to the screen, and he says, who wants to drink from the fire hose? And then he just opens up the fire hose, and that's the kids drink from the fire hose. You get to drink from the fire hose! So, yes, prepare to drink from the fire hose for all the stuff that we just covered yesterday. All righty, we to go through wicked fast. All right, that's all good. All right, so we started, we talked about the DOS header. The only things we care about in the DOS header is the magic, which is always MZ and the ELFA new, which gets us to the next data structure that we care about, which is the NT header. All right? That's the NT header, and that doesn't necessarily have to be immediately after the DOS header, and most of the time it isn't, because we said there's that little program, that DOS program, right after the DOS header that prints out, this is not a DOS program. All right? So, last field of the DOS header gets you to the start of the NT header. The NT header has two structures embedded in it, not pointed to, but embedded in it. It's got the signature, which is just PE, right, right there. Signature is just this, which is PE backwards, little Indian, some zero padding. And then embedded in it, it has the file header. And we had the machine that tells us the sort of CPU architecture, like just x86 code, x86-64, ARM, RISC, whatever. Uh, we had the time date stamp. That tells us basically the compile time. It's really the link time. but. That tells us when the person was sitting at Visual Studio compiling the thing. We have the number of sections. That tells us because there's this array of section <coughs> headers immediately after the optional header, we need to know how many of those data structures there are. All right, so we've got the number of sections. We've got the size of optional header. Technically, that can change. Later on, we'll probably have some even more interesting malformed malware, or, or just malformed PE files that'll be sort of like a harder level pack that's added on at the end of the game. But for now, I don't have that. But in that case, someone would potentially manipulate the size of optional header to basically, if you shrink the size of optional header, you're like cutting things off the end of the data directory, right? So you still will have the import maybe, because that's index one. But maybe you won't have the delay load entries or something like that. So. All right, and characteristics. And so what did we have for characteristics? We had things like, like I said, if you remember only one thing about the, op, the file header characteristics, I want you to remember that it has the flag saying this is a DLL. As other things like executable, that's on EXEs or DLLs. As other things like um, whether or not it supports large memory space and whether it's a 32-bit machine. Welcome to the jungle. Don't be that guy. Ask me questions. All right, optional header. All right, what do we care about here? Magic. This tells us whether this is a 32-bit optional header or a 64-bit optional header. There's 32, there's 64. All right, address of entry point. That's where the code starts. Image base. That's where this thing would like to be located in memory. That's where it assumes it's located in memory as far as all those constants and the you know, delay load imports or constants in the assembly go. Section alignment, this says we've got those sections, and if they're going to be mapped into memory, it's saying it would like them to be mapped at multiples of whatever this is. It's typically 1,000, x 1,000. File alignment, same thing. We've got these sections on file, and we'd like them to be mapped. Uh, we'd like them to be at offsets in the file of multiples of, for instance, 200. Size of image, this is the total size that this, mem this binary takes when it's loaded into memory. And because there can be sections, you know, mapped at some offset, and then because there can be gaps between sections, you should really just think of that as go to the last section, whatever offset it says, whatever RVA of the last section plus the size of the section, that's the total size that uh, it's going to have. 
the LL characteristics, this has the things like the, whether it's ASLR using the dynamic base flag, whether it supports DEP or NX, non-executable data, uh, whether it has structured exception handling, et cetera, and then data directory, which we cover all sorts of ways. Right, so these are some of the characteristics we said. The missing characteristic was that, that I quiz you on is that um, terminal server aware. Right? So terminal server aware means that it, it works with RDP well. So you typically not see this on things that are like command line tools and stuff like that. I can't remember whether command.exe has that or not. You can go check. All right, so data directory is just this big array of, uh, it's technically 16 things. I think only 15 of them are actually filled in. <coughs> And, you know, data directory is big because all these other topics that we're covering, imports, we'll talk about exports, but we saw delayed imports, found imports, those are all referenced from the data directory, right? So it's just an array of these structures at the end of the optional header. The structure has two fields in each entry. That's that important thing where if I'm asking you some questions about this or that index in the data directory, this is where you figure out what index it is. Quiz, I'll show it. Sections, we said, you know, there's some particular names. One that I forgot to tell you yesterday that I'll reiterate again that you should have written in your notes is that .pdata is 64-bit exception handling by convention. All right, so we've got an array of these section headers that's immediately after the optional header. And in the section headers, the things we care about are the name. It's just eight bytes. It can be whatever, as we saw yesterday. It can be, you know, left arrow, xeno, whatever. Uh, virtual size, we're always going to think of this as MISC virtual size. We'll never think of it as physical address. So you've got virtual address, that's saying where the section is mapped to memory. Virtual size is the total size it takes in memory. You've got pointer to raw data, that's where the thing starts in file. And you've got size of raw data, that's the total size that it takes in file. And we said, you know, size of raw data can be bigger than virtual size. Virtual size can be bigger than size of raw data. It all just has to do with whether you're padding out the file or whether you're padding out memory because you need some uninitialized variable space, basically global variable space. And characteristics, that's the stuff like read, write, execute, pageable or not, uh, discardable or not, and whether it contains code, whether it's shared. All right, sections can be named whatever. All right, then we went deep into imports, but the important thing is that the main import information starts at the directory entry import, that's index one. And that data director entry points at an array, which we call the import descriptor table or the import uh, directory. And this is an array of these data structures, one per DLL that you're importing from. All right, so it had two things we cared about, basically. The original first, long, first entry in this data structure points at the INT. That's wrong right there, INT. The last entry points at the IAT. So when you've got that one per DLL structure, just take the first field, points at the INT, last field points at the IAT. And so when we're thinking about INT and IAT and stuff like that, I prefer to just go straight to this sort of picture. INTs and IATs on disk point at these other structures that are going to be a hint. And again, this hint is an index in the export table, which we still haven't learned about. But there's going to be an export table somewhere in the other binary you're importing from that will have will say like <clears throat> here's the func here's the address of the function IO delete symbolically. And the hint is just trying to let the OS loader figure it out faster. It's saying, dear OS loader, try skipping down to entry 14B in the export table of the other guy and see if that's IO delete symbolically. If it's not, so be it, you're just going to have to search the strings until you find the appropriate one for IO delete symbolically. Basically, INT, that first entry in the data directory, the first field in the in a data directory entry, sorry, import descriptor table or import directory entry. The first field points at the INT, and the last field points at the IAT. On disk, they both point at the same thing. In memory, it gets flipped around that the IAT will get filled in with the real values at runtime. So those will be the real values of those functions. It's a madhouse. All right, 
there is a shortcut. Instead of having to go through that import directory table, instead of going up to here and over to here and down to here, and you know, try to figure out where the very base of the import address table is, you can just skip directly there by going to index 12 in the, uh, in the data directory. That'll get you right to the start of the IAT. Talked about IAT hooking just now. IAT hooking is basically a man in the middle attack where someone fills in the IAT with their own pointer instead of the legitimate pointer. All right, and then the last two things we talked about were bound imports and delayed load imports. See, and I couldn't even get through that in five minutes, ten minutes. Right, so first thing is that your normal imports, when you have bound imports, this time date stamp, which was zero before, is going to be negative one. That's kind of a tip off that you've got bound imports going on. And all bound imports are is that on disk, you're pre-filling in the address that you think would be filled in at runtime. If it turns out there's ASLR involved, then it'll be inaccurate. It'll have to be filled in again by the OS loader anyways. But you're basically just saying, I'm going to pre-fill it in with what I think it's going to be. So we found we find there's a separate data structure that's pointed to by this data directory entry, the entry bound import. And this is going to point out an array of these things, right? Image bound import descriptors. And so we showed that like this. You've got this array of these things pointed to by the data directory. And you have one of them per DLL. And it's basically just trying to say, this is the version of the DLL that I pre-filled stuff in with. And the version is given by this time date stamp, right? So the time date stamp is pulled out of the other file and it says, comdlg has this time date stamp. If you're trying to load this up right now and you don't see that time date stamp in comdlg, that means the pre-filled in stuff is probably going to be wrong. There's been a patch to that DLL. The, the functions could have moved around. So the pre-filled in stuff should not be assumed to be correct. Just do the normal thing that you do to resolve imports. All right, and then within this, because I asked questions about how many of these structures are there, when you have that sort of question, you just add up all the entries. Uh, you t add up all the entries except the null entry and subtract out however many things there are that have non-zero for the number of forwarders. Or if I ask you how many forwarders there are, you would just sum up all these non-zero entries because this is basically a mix of two data structures right now. These things that have zeros in them, they're image-bound import descriptors. And the things immediately after something that has a non-zero entry, if this says one, that means there's going to be one of these forwarder ref structures next. If it said two, there would be two forwarder structures next, and then you'd go back to just regular bound import descriptors. All right, again, CFF Explorer, this is kind of what it looks like. You have Fs for the time date stamp if you're dealing with bound imports. And you can see that these things are kind of filled in with absolute virtual addresses. <laughs> All right, ASLR and binding are kind of at, at odds with each other because um, if you're pre-filling it in based on the assumption that a given module gets loaded at the image base in its headers, right? And with ASLR, it's most likely not going to be loaded at that image base, so things will most likely get moved around. And delay load imports, again, data directory entry points at an array of these structures, one per DLL, these delay import descriptors, or more correctly, image import, image delay descriptors. And this has, again, three things. We've got a name, and just a pointer to the IIT, pointer to the INT. And so delay loads, as we just talked about, it's all about filling in the stub code with the absolute code at runtime, right when function gets called. <coughs> All right, that is it.